All right, it's 11.30, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, it's awesome to see a full room. Thanks all for coming uh, to Hot From The Labs HTML5 Web Sockets. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the keynote this morning. There's a lot of uh, cool stuff going on, and actually a few sort of spatterings of information about WebSockets and HTML5 Labs, so we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at that and um, hopefully show you some, some things that are of interest today. My name is Craig Kitterman. I am a Senior Technical Ambassador in the Interoperability Strategy Team in Microsoft Corporate. I have with me today my colleague Paul Batum, who is with the WCF team. He's going to join me uh, in the latter part of the presentation to take a closer look at some of the uh, implementation deals, details of actually programming against WebSockets and how the, how the uh, protocol actually works. So what, what we're going to do first, though, is take a look at how WebSockets sort of fits into the overall scope of what is known today as HTML5. Um, HTML5 is a term that's used in a number of different contexts. It means a lot of different things to a lot of people. Um, but generally, it's considered to be a set of technologies that enables uh, you know, the, next, the next web. And HTML5 plays an important, sorry, WebSockets rather, plays an important role in that. It's a cool emerging technology. Um, but it's right now in a very iterative state. And so I want to share with you uh, sort of what's going on with WebSockets, where it is, and what Microsoft is doing to make that technology available to developers to explore and play with um, because it really is something interesting and cool. So you, you probably heard a lot about this concept of real-time web. And this is the idea that um, a browser can interact with the server and exchange information in a very fast and seamless and low latency kind of way. Um, push messages are one sort of um, personification of this notion. So when I, one uh, example that I often give when I'm explaining this concept to people is, is uh, the, the classic kind of Twitter example. If you have a Twitter feed and you're looking at your timeline, and if you follow as many people as I do, Oftentimes, you'll log on to Twitter, and you'll kind of be reading along your messages. And after a few minutes, you'll see a little blue box appear at the top that says, you have 11 new tweets, or 20 new tweets, or what have you. And basically, that is, um, you know, some communication took place between the client and the server. And the server said, hey, there's some more things for you here. There's some more tweets that have come in uh, from, your, you know, from your set of people that you follow. And you probably want to check back with me and get, the, get that data. But the server didn't actually just push that message to the client when it was ready. There was some other uh, stuff that had to take place in order for the client to get that information. Um, and trying to make that work is actually kind of a, a, a tricky problem. It's way trickier than it actually should be, from, in my opinion, anyway. So there's a few different methods for doing that kind of thing. Now, when you're using HTTP, which on the web, that's sort of what we do, is we use HTTP. There's a couple different ways to approach this problem. Well, there's a number of different ways to approach this problem, but there's a couple that are a little bit more common. The first one is a standard polling method. So if you've been doing web development for as long as I have, um, you've probably written something that looks like this top one, which is you know, every five seconds or 10 seconds or minute or whatever, asks the server, hey, are there any new chat messages for me? Are there any new uh, updated stock prices for me? Do I have any more tweets or any more, you know, Facebook messages or what have you. So there's a round tripping that takes place from the browser to the server that just says, hey, anything for me. And there's a polling interval of whatever is designated. Obviously, the smaller the polling interval, the more updated and relevant the information on the client is going to be. The longer the polling interval, um, you know, the less fresh your data is going to be on the client, but the smaller the load on the server, the less bandwidth you're using, et cetera. So there's some trade-offs to be made there. Um, there's a sort of philosophy about doing this um, known as Comet. Maybe, if you have, maybe many of you have um, worked with uh, some of the methods um, that are sort of described by Comet. And one of those is, is long polling. Long polling is sort of taking this problem and turning it upside down in a way. Um, and rather than doing this sort of request where you say, hey, is anything for me? Nope. OK, thank you. What you do is the client actually issues a request to the server. The server then holds that request until there is a message uh, for the client. So again, going back to the Twitter example, the server would literally hold on to that message until a new tweet came and say, oh, there's a new tweet. 
Here's another one, here's another one. Except for when the client receives that message, it has to, in order to get ready for the next message from the server, immediately issue another request back to the server, and then the server holds that request until there's something else for the client. So you can see the pattern is not based on a time interval, but rather based on when information is actually uh, ready to be sent to the client. Now, from a scalability point of view, this, char this, this really poses a bunch of challenges. So you can imagine the web server at Twitter, sorry, this is a, a good, a, a common example, so uh, I use it all the time, but at Twitter, for example, there's you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of clients out there, and then you could imagine if every single one of them was using long polling, that web server would be holding on to those tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of requests and just waiting to service those. So the resources that are required in order to service that type of request is tremendous. Um, the other issue here is HTTP, for those of you who know HTTP, know that the headers that are associated with HTTP requests and responses carry a lot of metadata along with them. And in a case like this, the actual payload for a request like, do I have a tweet or how many tweets do I have, may be something as small as an integer. But if you think about all of that extra payload that comes along with an HTTP header, you're wasting bandwidth maybe on the order of 100 times or even more um, um, compared to what's actually needed to carry that, that payload, which is the actual number of tweets that I need to go get. So, so HTTP is sort of just not optimized for this scenario. And going back to long polling, actually trying to program this thing is a real pain. So it's, it's a little bit better maybe than polling in some regards, but actually trying to make it work is not an easy thing to do. So if you've ever tried to do that, you probably know. So WebSockets technology was really designed and invented to address this problem for browser to server communication. Now it's not limited to a browser, but it was sort of designed for that scenario. It gives you a fully, you know, full duplex bi-directional TCP socket directly from the client to the server that is exposed via an API um, that can be programmed against using JavaScript um, in a very simple and straightforward way. There's the obvious bandwidth savings that I talked about in terms of just the HTTP headers and that kind of overhead. And you have the scalability advantages, meaning that the resources required on the server side in order to handle a TCP socket is much, much less than it is to manage HTTP, uh, you know, holding of HTTP requests in a long polling scenario. So you get a nice, thick, open connection. Messages can be sent at any time asynchronously from either direction. And then there's, you know, an easy way to build handler code on the client and the server to actually process those messages. So the technology uh, WebSockets is really um, a collection of technology that's contained within two specifications. Um, there, there's, there's the protocol piece. The protocol piece describes what does the WebSockets communication actually look like when it goes over the wire? So what do, actually, what do the actual data frames look like? How does a client and server behave? What is the handshake process? All of that is defined within the protocol specification. And the protocol specification is currently going through standardization inside of IETF in the high by working group. Now IETF is sort of the, for those who aren't familiar, the globally recognized leader in terms of doing standards for protocols. They're the protocol experts. And what you have in IETF is industry leaders from a number of different uh, large corporations, every major corporation uh, in IT, as well as a number of different special interests in the technology community, open source community and, and beyond, that have a, have a vested interest in, in technologies like WebSockets, and they all sit around a table and come to consensus on what gets in the spec and what, you know, what doesn't get in the spec. So that's the protocol layer. Now, in order to actually program against WebSockets and take advantage of this cool bi-directional, you know, high bandwidth capability, you need a, a programming framework that's easily accessible to a web developer. That's where the W3C comes in. Now W3C, now IETF is the experts on protocols, W3C are the web experts. This is where web standards really, really uh, take place. So the what W3C is building a specification inside of the, um, the web applications working group 
which specifies what that interface looks like for developers. What's that JavaScript API that allows you to open a connection, send a message, receive a message, close a connection, and sort of everything in between. And uh, Paul's going to show us in a little while what it means to actually work with that API. So just keep in mind here, there's two distinct specifications. Um, they're evolving separately in these various working groups. Um, certainly there's synchronization that takes place as a feature appears in, let's say, the protocol. You know, that feature needs to appear at a certain point in the W3C spec, but these things are evolving on, on two separate paths. So I just want to take a step back a little bit now and talk about, you know, how does this WebSocket thing fit into the bigger picture of HTML? So there's a number of working groups, two of which we just talked about, that are working on pieces of HTML5. Now there's a specification called HTML version 5, but there's all these other, all these other specs that are generally part of this, this thing that really uh, make the HTML5 web the way that we think about it today. And all those cool demos you saw this morning are based on really this set of technologies, this larger set. And there's a number of working groups who are actually doing the work to make all of those technologies really site ready and ready to be implemented by browser developers. And then, you know, after that, of course, ready to be implemented by the web development community at large. So you have the geolocation working group, you have web performance, CSS, the actual HTML working group, SVG, that cool anime demo this morning, that thing just blew my mind. I couldn't, I couldn't believe that that was SVG, that was awesome. And the web applications working group, which is where the, the um, JavaScript API is happening inside of W3C. So that, those are some of the um, W3C working groups. You have ECMAScript, also known as JavaScript, that working group is actually in ECMA, which is a, a standards uh, body based out of Europe. And then down in the corner here, you have HiBuy, which is the working group uh, in IETF, which owns the WebSockets protocol. So you can see there's a lot of different groups working on these various sets of technologies. Over 100 specifications um, included in this generally considered set of HTML5. And each of those working groups has a bunch of them. So it's not just one spec, one working group. There's a big set of specs here. And I don't expect you to be able to read that. So folks in the back don't, don't expect that uh, anyone can read that. But uh, the, the point is that each of these working groups is looking at a lot of different technologies. All of these specs that are in the standardization process are in a, very, in a state of flux. So I think everyone who was in the keynote anyway saw that video this morning about the the WebSocket spec iterating, version 76, it's now version 77, it's now version 70, whatever. And um, the challenges that that can face. So you can see here there's sort of five generally considered states of a spec if it's going through a standardization process. This is sort of a generalized model. But you'll see it starts with a first published, or a first published working draft. And then after that, there's a number of working drafts. As those consortia come together, as those working groups uh, iterate, and they share ideas and bring input from their, their whether it's a corporation or their community, those specs continue to evolve. At a certain point, it reaches a level of stability where the committee members are satisfied. At that point, it, it reaches a last call status and eventually gets pushed through to a, a candidate recommendation, which is sort of like an RC from the you know, software world, and into a final recommendation. And you know, browser vendors have to take a decision in terms of what is the right level of stability for their users um, to be able to count on and trust that browser uh, implementation of that spec? Um, the HTML5 spec itself, for example, went to last call last May. So that just gives you an example of where we are. So Microsoft's approach, Dean talked about it already this morning. I'm not going to go all the way through this. But the point is that we look at this complicated ecosystem where there's a lot of specs evolving across this broad spectrum of HTML5 specs. And we say the ones that are site ready, the ones that have reached this certain level of maturity where the, the number of iterations has gone down and there's consensus within the working groups and there's, there's real maturity, that's, that's when it becomes stable and it becomes what we call site ready. And that's when we're going to take that spec and put it into a browser like IE9. Um, we, work, we work closely with developers through the platform preview releases and get that feedback um, to make sure that what we do put into IE9 is, is, is really ready. We invest on interoperability. The, uh, this, this is all about testing, so that when you actually go and you write against, let's say, CSS 2.1, you want to make sure if you write against CSS 2.1 and you test it in IE9, it's going to render faith faithfully in Chrome and Firefox and Safari and everything else. So we submitted over 7,000 test cases just for CSS alone to make sure that you get that real true interoperability uh, capability between browser implementations. 
And last but not least, we innovate with emerging standards in HTML5 labs, which we're going to talk about. So the history of WebSockets started out with the first working drafts of the protocol specification back in uh, early 2009. And there were 76 community drafts of the spec that were, um, that were iterated on over a relatively short period of time. So that's sort of the, the uh, source of that video was this, time, this point in time where these specs were just really rolling over at a very quick pace. A lot of things were changing. Um, I, sorry, the W3C um, looked at that spec and said, this is going to be really important for web developers. And we need to make this uh, something that's useful. We need to make an API that gives developers the tools they need in order to actually take advantage of this. So they started inside the web applications working group, uh, middle 2009, building the first drafts of the API spec. Um, at the end of 2009, the protocol spec was actually brought to IE, IETF and, set, and they said, look, we want to make this thing a formal international standard. You're the protocol experts. So IETF said, okay, we will, we will continue to the stewardship of this spec and bring it forward. So that's been happening all along. Now let's take a look at the timeline of what the browsers have done uh, given the context of this evolution. In January of 2010, both Chrome and Safari implemented version 75 of the IETF, I'm sorry, of the original uh, set of specifications. This is before IETF even took over the specs. Um, so people took it, they started playing with it. Naturally, it's in the browser. It's a cool technology. People are going to start playing with it, building sites, etc. cetera. Um, unfortunately, what happened when version 76 came along was that there was breaking changes in the specification itself from version 75 to version 76 that rendered those implementations uh, incompatible with one another. So there was a not, no longer interoperability between version 75 and version 76. So whether you had a, a client or a server implemented on version 75, that thing was only going to work with, with the same. It wasn't going to work with a client or a server implementing uh, version 76 of the protocol spec. So you can imagine this is a pretty frustrating experience for a developer. Well, Opera and, uh, and Firefox joined the game at this point and said, okay, well, 76 is starting to feel a little more stable, so we're going to go ahead and implement those. We're going to implement version 76. And uh, um, Chrome and Safari upgraded their implementation to version 76. Now, in the, at the end of 2010, a security researcher identified a potential security issue in the WebSockets protocol. Now, there's been a lot of debate around the industry as to the validity of the claim. But the point is that um, there, was a, there was somewhat of a scare among you know, the people who are implementing the spec. The, IT, the IETF working group, the HiBuy working group, has since made some uh, modifications into the protocol to actually address those concerns, um, re regardless of their validity, just to make sure that those concerns have gone away. But in the meantime, both Firefox and Opera actually disabled uh, WebSocket support in those browsers by default. So you can see there's you know, a trickle of people starting to use it. Then these four major browsers implemented it, then two of them turned it off, and you know, the thing is continuing to evolve. Um, as you can see on the top, in the middle row there, the 76 specs before it even went to IETF. In IETF, there's been six versions of the spec, so there's already been over 80 drafts of this spec, and it's continuing to evolve. So that's sort of the context for HTML5 labs. Microsoft uh, launched HTML5 labs a couple of months ago, and the idea here is really to give developers um, some actual bits, some codes, a client and a server implementation of these technologies that, that allows you to actually go play with it, see what's possible, build some prototype implementations on this stuff, try out some new things that weren't, that weren't really possible in the sort of classic HTTP realm, um, and see what's, see what's possible. Give your feedback. Give your feedback to Microsoft. Give your feedback to W3C, IETF to make sure that when those specs do reach a level of maturity, that they're ready to be implemented broadly across all the browsers in a more stable and interoperable way, that the features um, that are important to the web development community make it into those specs. Um, so what we've done with HTML5 Labs is we have a prototype of, of uh, WebSockets, I'm which I'm going to show you here. And what we're trying to do is really iterate on this thing on a fairly regular basis. So as IETF releases new versions of the protocol, Within a couple of weeks, we're going to release another version of the uh, HTML5 lab for WebSockets or for the other technologies that I'll show you to make sure that you're, you're really keeping up 
if you're, if you're taking advantage of this prototype, you're really keeping up with the evolution of the spec. So you know that whatever you do is going to be sort of the latest and the greatest. And we're going to continue to iterate and iterate and evolve and try to stay agile and on top of these things. So with that, I'm going to take you out to HTML5 Labs and show you a little bit of a demo about what we can do with WebSockets. So first I'll show you this, just the site itself. Um, there's a really long, horrible URL, but you can get there, html5labs.com. Um, it's html5labs.interoperabilitybridges.com. I apologize. I've, I've, I apologize. Um, so this is the site, and you'll see here what we have is there's four technologies that so far we're working on prototypes for. We're here today to talk about WebSockets, but you can see also we have IndexedDB, File API, and we just announced today that we're going to be doing some interesting things with Media Capture API, and that's going to come in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. But if you're interested in IndexedDB or File API, um, go check those out as well. But on the WebSockets prototype, uh, we have here the ability to download the prototype. And this really gives you the code that I mentioned, a client implementation and a server implementation that you can run on your local machine. You can look at the source code and understand how these things were written. Um, and then you can make your own implementations and prototypes to take advantage of the technology. So that's all available if you go and you download the prototype this way. You'll get a zip file with a bunch of interesting stuff in it, some readmes to help you get started. We also have a few games up here um, that you can play. And if you're, in the, if you're doing this right now, please just hold on for a second because um, the server is limited to, to a small number of connections. Um, and I want to make sure I can at least do the demo, because I'm literally running this on the production server. OK, so I clicked the one that said Puzzle Demo. And I have two different browsers open here. And I logged into both of them, one as myself and one as Bizarro Me, Bizarro Craig. And now I want to play this game. So practically what's happening here is I have a, a WebSocket connection. You can see on the top here, Socket Open. So I have a, an active open TCP socket between each one of these browsers to a server back in Redmond. OK? And I apologize, the resolution is less than stellar here. But um, what, what this is is a puzzle game. So there's a bunch of pieces here. And you take the puzzle piece and you drag it over onto the puzzle board. And your opponent does the same. The objective of the game, in this case, is to place more pieces in the right place before your opponent does. But the cool bit is that while I'm dragging a piece on this side, the position information from my canvas, this is using, uh, this is using canvas tag, is being transmitted uh, on the mouse move up to the server through the WebSocket and back down to the other client. So you can see uh, how much data it takes to actually transmit that and get that kind of uh, real-time performance is, is pretty amazing. So then I dropped that piece and I actually got, got it right. So you can see my score is updated here. Bizarro Craig 1, Craig nothing. And I can do that like that. And then same thing goes over here. If I'm this person, as I drag, um, my position information shows up here. And I think I'm putting these things in the wrong place. I'm horrible at this game. So, All right, now the score is tied. But you can see, you can see how this works. Now, if you look down here, we have just a little uh, log here that shows you all the messages that are actually getting sent up the WebSocket. So there's some coordinate information that's getting transmitted on a very frequent basis up to the server. The server is recognizing that, hey, I'm connected with this other guy. We're, he, you know, we're partnered for the game. He's the one I need to send the message to. So it sends the message down his socket pipe and says, your opponent's piece is now here. So render that thing. Um, using JavaScript and using Canvas on your machine. So you can see what each other is doing and try to race and, and get the game done. So that's, uh, that's an example of what, what you can do. On the HTML5 Labs site, um, there's a few other links here. There's a chat one, which, uh, you know, chat is sort of like the perfect example for this type of technology. You actually have a real-time chat that doesn't have any kind of polling. A couple different uh, demos. With, there's two game demos, a stock ticker demo, et cetera. Um, we also have an implementation that's using Jetty for the server side. So you take a look at that if you're, uh, if you're a Jetty user. Um, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to invite Paul to come up. And he's going to actually show you how to program against WebSockets um, from scratch and then teach you a little bit about the client-server uh, handshaking and some of the protocol information underneath. So Paul. Morning. So 
I really like WebSockets in that it's so easy to get started doing development. Uh, I'm going to show you, a, a, you know, hello world in WebSockets, sort of simple demo from scratch. It's not going to be fancy, uh, but you'll see what you need to do to get started with WebSockets development. And we're going to use the, the prototype on the HTML5 Labs website. So I'm going to create a couple of projects. I want a client and a server. I'm going to go ahead and make my client. My client is just going to be an empty web project. So this will be a WebSocket client. OK, and I want a server as well. So we'll add a server. For the server, I'm just going to use a C Sharp console application just to host my WebSocket service. So I'm going to go over here and grab a console app. OK. So I'm going to start on the server. And the idea for this is all I'm going to do is make a web page that's got a couple of text boxes. I'll type into one text box. And as I type, we'll use a WebSocket connection to send the contents of that box to a server. Server will reverse it, uh, reverse the string, and send it back over the WebSocket connection. The uh, web page will receive the reversed version back and just stick it in the second text box. You'll see some round tripping between the client and the server, and we'll get it done in a few minutes. So I'm going to add some references. What I want is I want to grab the some of the stuff that's installed on your machine, the bits that you get when you install the prototype. So there's a WCF WebSockets folder inside Microsoft SDK's program files. So we're going to go and go to the bin folder and some assemblies here I want to reference. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that and then go ahead and browse and add this. Oh, I'm already there. OK, great. I'm going to add those. I also need system service models. So if, you're, if you've worked with WCF at all, uh, some of this might be a little bit familiar. The WebSockets prototype, the server implementation, is WCF based. And add system service model as well. OK. So I've got my references. Now I'm just going to set both of these as startup projects because I always forget to do that if I don't do it now. All right. So I'm going to make a service, a WebSocket service, and I'm going to add a class. It's going to reverse strings, so we'll just call it a reverse service. I'm going to go ahead and use the namespace, the assembly I added. It's really easy to make this service because there's a base class I can inherit from. So I'm just going to go WebSocket service here. And this is what makes this so easy is it gives me a bunch of methods that I can override. So if I say override, I get on close, on error, on open, a bunch of different, different methods that will get called. So I want to reverse the string. So I'm just going to say string reversed is equal to string join. So I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm just reversing all the characters and concatenating them back together. And now I want to send the reverse string back. So I'll say send message, and I'm going to say reversed. So that's all, got, all, that's all my WebSocket service is. I receive a message, I reverse the contents, send it back. Now I need to host this service. Again, this would be familiar if you've done any work with WCF. You create a service and then, and then you host it. So I'm going to go and go to my program. Uh, I need to grab this namespace here. I'm just going to copy that in. I'm going to make a host. And there's a WebSockets host here. And there's a generic parameter. The generic parameter is which service we want to host. So it's my reverse service. Uh, is everything OK? Uh, somehow I didn't get service model added. I must have screwed that up somehow, sorry. OK, it's there now. OK, that's fine. All right, so we need to add an endpoint for this for this uh, host. We need to know where we're actually going to host the WebSocket at. So this is going to be a URI, a WebSocket URI. So we use ws colon slash slash. This is going to be localhost. 
sorry, I'm full screen, custom port. I'm going to talk a little bit more about WebSocket URIs once we get to the client. Bear with me for now. We'll just put that in there. I'm going to open the host. And I just need to stop this program from like ending. So I'm just going to do a console read line here. OK. So this is my WebSocket server. Not flashy, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. I want to work on the client now. I want a HTML page. Now, I'm going to do a bit of JavaScript. And I don't do JavaScript without jQuery, so I'm going to go and grab that. Uh, so there's a bunch of samples here that were, again, installed when I installed the prototype. I'm just going to go in here and grab some scripts. So I'll drag jQuery in, and we'll stick that in. OK. So I need to just put a tiny little bit of markup here. As I said, I just want to do some text boxes. So we'll just say this. Whoop. Hmm. Yeah, jQuery on the brain. I want a second box, which is just going to be where I put the messages. OK. So I want to add some JavaScript. When the DOM's loaded, I want to go ahead and create that uh, WebSocket connection. So we'll say document ready. I'm just going to make a connect function and put it in there. So creating the WebSocket connection is really easy. I'm using the native API here. So I'm going to say WebSocket is equal to new WebSocket. And I'm going to provide a URI again. So this will be ws colon slash slash. Please jump, uh, yell out if you see me do anything stupid with a quote or anything like that. <laughs> Thanks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this before I do the port number. Uh, WebSocket URIs are very similar to HTTP URIs. Uh, you can run them over SSL. So rather than WS prefix, you would have WSS if you want to tunnel over SSL. Uh, you don't have to provide a custom port number. I did because there's uh, some limitations with the prototype today. But WebSockets is designed to run over the default ports that HTTP uses. So this would run over port 80 today. If I was to use WSS, I'd be running over 443, just like normal SSL. I also want to point out that WebSocket URIs, you can use things like query strings and stuff. So maybe if I was doing a stock ticker demo, I could say I want a ticker, and the stock code I'm interested in is MSFT. So the idea here is that you could have, you host one service, which is a, a stock ticker. But then it gets the query string parameter, and so it knows which particular stock code to be sending updates over that WebSocket connection. I'm not doing that today, so we'll put this back. My port and reverse, same as on the server. OK, so this is going to go ahead and actually establish the WebSocket connection. You don't call open or, or connect or anything like that. And we're going to do, there's going to be some I.O. there, and we want like a callback. We want an event. We want to know when the actual WebSocket connection was established successfully. So we can do that by saying on open. So here I'm passing a, I'm providing a function to run when the WebSocket's opened. I'm just going to append a connected message just so we can tell what's going on. I also want to, at this point, once the WebSocket connection's established, I want to start paying attention to what's happening on my, on my input box uh, and sending WebSocket messages. So I'm going to use the key up event. So we'll say input box key up. Again, I'm just going to provide a function here to run. So I want to grab the value that's in the box and send it on the WebSocket. So that's pretty easy. We can say WebSocket send. And then I just want to grab the input box and grab its value. So I'm grabbing the value of what's in there and just sending it on the WebSocket. I also want to know when the WebSocket was closed. I'm just going to do the same thing here, except say closed instead of connected. Finally, for this to actually do, oops, for this to do anything, 
I want to know when we receive messages. I'm going to, there's going to be an event argument that I can use. And when I receive a message, I just want to stick the value in the box. So we say output box, value. The event has a data property. That's the actual payload, what message was sent. So paid, lo paid loads, page loads. We connect to the WebSocket, and then we have these events. We should see some round tripping between my client and my server now. Let's go ahead, make sure. I'm going to, so I've used native WebSockets here, so I'm going to run in a uh, private build of Firefox that I have that supports the 06 version of, of WebSockets. And that's the same version as the prototype uh, that supports today. So I, I want to run, because I'm using the native API, I want to run uh, within, within Firefox. I'm just going to browse with and make sure mine, OK, so it's called Minefield when you get a private build. Um, but I want to make sure that's set as the default. And let's hope I didn't forget anything. Sure. OK, so I can say, hello world, using WebSockets. OK, it seems to work pretty good. So it doesn't take very long to get something up and running. Uh, but I want to show you how you could also add the same behavior to uh, a browser that doesn't have native WebSockets support today, such as IE. The HTML5 Labs prototype has got a Silverlight component that's going to handle the communication, as Craig mentioned. And I want to show you how easy it is to sort of just drop that in there. So I have to go and grab a couple of things. From the scripts folder, I want, there's a Silverlight WebSocket jQuery plugin. I'm going to drop that in, and a Silverlight script. I also need to go ahead and grab the, uh, the client bin folder. This has got the actual Silverlight component. This is a zap file in here. So I need to go ahead and reference this, uh, this jQuery Silverlight WebSocket script. And I need to make a few changes to make this work. First of all, this, this is not going to work if I run in a browser that doesn't support native WebSockets uh, today. The, the plugin uh, defines a WebSocket draft object rather than WebSocket. It does this so that you're not going to stomp over a browser's implementation. Um, so I've got, I'm going to say, do I have WebSocket defined? If so, let's go ahead and use that. So this code path here, we're in native mode. We're using native WebSockets. But if we don't have it defined, let's just do the same thing, but use WebSocket draft instead. All right. Um, there is a few extra steps. Sorry, there's one extra step. I have to give the... Silverlight component time to load. I do this by just calling set timeout and then running connect after a second. Like there's a few other ways to do this. This is probably the, just the fastest way for the purposes of a demo. But uh, it won't work straight away because uh, the Silverlight component isn't loaded yet. So I do that and I should be good to go. All right, so let's make sure, let's run it again and make sure that I haven't broken my implementation, my native implementation. Um, you can see this big blue thing loading up. So this is, a, this is like a Silverlight component. So this is loading because I put the script on the top of the file. So it's, it's always going to load. But I've got, that, I've got that check to figure out which code path I should actually run through. So we'll just make sure that this still works. Well, great, OK. So I'm going to grab the same URI and stick it in IE. OK, and we'll say hello world from I. OK, so I now have a really simple WebSockets demo that's running across multiple browsers. I like this uh, approach of like, using the Silverlight component while this, the spec is you know, still in draft and is being worked on. Because if uh, 07, the WebSocket 07 comes out, I'll need to go ahead and grab a new version of, um, of, of Firefox if I wanted to run a website that was, was using that 07. But in the, in the case where you're using the plugin, you could just go ahead and go up to your server and put in the updated version of the plugin. And then anybody who hits that, who hits that site is going to load the updated plugin. So it, it's got some flexibility there, which is great. All right, let's close this up.
I've covered what it's like to sort of just program with WebSockets very simply. Um, now what I want to do is, is talk a little bit about what's happening under the covers. Uh, because the, the API is, is so sort of nice, easy to use, you, you can't really tell what's happening on the wire at all. Uh, we don't have a huge amount of time to go into, into the details of the protocol, but the opening handshake uh, for WebSockets is particularly interesting. It's the sort of the unique characteristic for WebSockets. It's wh why it works over the open web. So I'm going to run through the opening handshake. The thing to realize with the WebSockets handshake is that it's initiated using HTTP. So we've got a client here sending a HTTP request to a server. What this actually looks like is something that would be pretty familiar to you if you already speak HTTP. We're doing a get on example.com slash chat. Um, so we're just saying this is, this is the resource we, we want to grab. But we're saying that the underlying connection that we're using, I mean, we established a TCP connection, and we're doing some HTTP traffic on that connection. We want to upgrade that connection to use WebSockets. So these two headers are, are a pair. They go together. You say connection upgrade, and then upgrade WebSocket. Next, what we have is some specific WebSocket headers. They're all prefixed with sec dash. Purpose of this is you can't set sec dash headers on XML HTTP request. What that means is that you can't mimic a WebSockets connection via Ajax. If you try to, try to do it with the functionality that's in your browser, it won't work because you're not going to be able to set these headers. So this gives us some guarantee that if a WebSocket connection is coming from a browser, it's happening through the, web, through the browser's API for WebSockets. And then there'll be some guarantees that the browser can make about how that WebSocket connection is going to be established. The key here, this is just a set of random bytes that have been Base64 encoded. The, the server's going to process this key and send a value back to the client. We'll talk about that a little bit more once we get to the response from the server. But for now, this is just a set of random, random bytes. The origin. So we're reusing the, uh, the the origin security model that's already used for, for JavaScript today. What we want to know is the, the script that is creating the WebSocket connection, where that script came from. We want to pass that information to a, the WebSocket server so that it can make a decision about whether or not it makes sense to accept or reject that connection. The real goal here is to prevent malicious JavaScript from creating WebSocket connections that servers are then forced to, to honor. We want to give those servers the opportunity to recognize whether or not that connection that's being established, whether or not it makes sense for them to accept it. I also want to point out that you can have WebSocket clients that aren't the browser. And you've got no guarantee in those circumstances that the origin was actually set uh, correctly. You're, this is really a, a, a precaution that's designed for, for malicious JavaScript in mind. So you, it's not a it doesn't it's not a blanket uh, solution. Works for JavaScript though. Finally, I have the version. Makes sense that you want the client and the server to be speaking the same version of the WebSockets protocol. So that's what it looks like when we establish that 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 uh, the connection. That's what what goes what goes up. Now I also want to point out that you, there could be a bunch of other HTTP here. You could have cookies, for example. You're, you're not speaking WebSockets yet. That means you can leverage all of the great functionality that HTTP has. Maybe if my server you know, doesn't want to accept the connection, because what it actually wants to do is redirect. Or maybe it wants to send a 401. You, you need to do authentication, for example. We get a lot of value out of building the WebSockets handshake on top of HTTP. There's a lot of functionality there that, that we can use. Let's take a look at what it, what it looks like if the server is actually happy with the, the request and wants to accept. We get a switching protocols response. So this looks like a one, it's a 101. So this is basically, yes, I want to accept the, the upgrade. We have the same. Headers as before, the server's being very explicit about uh, what's being accepted. The, the value here, um, I mentioned the random bytes that were, were being sent. The server's going to take those. It's going to concatenate a, 
specific good. It's going to take a hash and then base64 encode that and send that back. So why do we have this convoluted process? It's so that the client has some guarantee that it's talking to a, a server that actually really does understand WebSockets. You don't really want a, a WebSocket server, uh, so you don't want a HTTP server that just knows, oh, you're, you're requesting an upgrade. Sure, I'll send a 101 response to, to, to confuse things. We want to give some guarantees that the client and the server uh, are both understand how to speak WebSockets. So the client will look at this value, it'll have done the same calculation and just check that they're the same. So once we get past that, we're no longer talking HTTP. We have WebSocket data frames that are going back and forth across the wire from the client and the server. And these frames can be, have a binary payload or they can have UTF-8 encoded text. So there's a bit of a discrepancy here because if you look at the W3C API today, it doesn't support binary. And Craig mentioned that the two specifications are sort of on separate schedules, they're evolving separately. So I would expect that before too long there will, I mean, I, you can't quote me on this, but I would expect before too long there will be binary support in the JavaScript API for, for, for WebSockets. Especially because there are some, I know some people in Microsoft that are already working with the W3C to, to get that through. I also want to point out that you don't have to send messages. Uh, the WebSockets protocol allows you to flag traffic that you're sending as being a continuation of some data that you already sent. And so you could send, send some, some data and then send some more and say it's a continuation and send some more and say it's a continuation. And you keep doing that, what you're doing is you're creating a stream. Again, there's a bit of a discrepancy. Again, today, the JavaScript API doesn't support uh, streaming. We'll see what happens there. OK, so that wraps up my coverage of, of the opening handshake and the protocol. I'll hand it back to you, Craig. All right, thanks, Paul. Thank you, Paul. So we just want to wrap up with uh, a couple of links for everyone. Um, if you're interested by this and you want to go actually play with that stuff, again, go check out HTML5 Labs. And again, it's not just WebSockets. There's a lot of things happening there. But I'm really keen to have more people actually trying these things out, sending us feedback. What are the types of samples? I mean, if you want to see sample code that does something that's not, not obvious, you know, talk to us about that. We might be able to help you actually put some different sample code together. Um, you know, engage in the process. If you're interested in uh, understanding where the high by working group and IETF is with the protocol spec, when they're releasing new versions, what kinds of conversations are taking place, go check out the high by working group. Uh, subscribe to the mailing list. Engage. Uh, the same, of course, goes for the W3C on the on the JavaScript API. I can see um, a lot of a lot of potential opportunity in the in the continued evolution of that spec with some of the features that Paul mentioned that are already included in the protocol that are probably going to eventually get rolled into to the JavaScript API as well. And of course, this is your front line as a web developer is that actual API. This is where you're going to actually play. So engage in the process and, and take a look at what's happening. Um, there's a few related sessions. Uh, for those who are interested, the future of HTML5 uh, by our colleague uh, Giorgio. That's coming on Thursday. Um, data in an HTML5 world is going to talk about some different uh, data technologies. Um, there's some really cool stuff going on there, including things like IndexedDB and File API. Uh, that one's also Thursday. And then WCF Web APIs, there's a URI for that. I like that one. So that's Glenn Block Thursday as well. So a lot of things going on Thursday. Uh, contact info for me if you have more questions on HTML5 Labs or uh, the WebSockets prototypes or any of the prototypes on HTML5 Labs, please contact me. Uh, my Twitter's at Craig Kitterman, URL Craig.Kitterman.net, and Paul is Paul Batum and PaulBatum.com. Um, so we have just a couple of minutes left for questions. So what I'd like to do is invite everyone, if you have a question, please come to the mic so we can get it on the, on the stream and the recording. Um, and we'll be happy to answer questions for the next uh, couple of minutes. Yes. Hi. Hi. Well, <laughs> um, have you tried it uh, through firewalls and proxies? Uh, like corporate proxies, is it, does it? Uh, yeah. Um, what's the statistics? If you if you're on SSL, it's pretty good. Proxies and firewalls and that are pretty used to sort of getting out of the way if you're you're, you're on SSL traffic. And so I think that like a, 
in practice, especially like once WebSockets is at the point where people are really just sort of developing, de developing out in the wild, but the proxy infrastructure and stuff hasn't really caught up on it, people will be using SSL. That, that, that's going to be the, the, the first protocol there to sort of address the issues. The, I know that the uh, success rates that I've read on SSL are around 90% or something like that. You, if you're not on SSL, it's something more like 50%. But there's going to be a lot of work with the uh, proxy vendors and that to, to get em an embracement of, of WebSockets. I mean, the problem is that some of them at the moment are like looking at your uh, request and seeing that it's got an upgrade in it and just saying, no. Um, and I think that it, you know, as web, uh, WebSockets becomes more popular, uh, we'll gain some traction. We'll see some, some changes made to the, the internet infrastructure out there. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you handle uh, user authentication with WebSockets? Do you get cookies? So you can use cookies. Um, you, could, you could use whatever, uh, there'd be a number of different types of uh, schemes you could use. There's nothing really covered in the protocol or the API. Like None of what's being specified talks about user authentication. It's considered to be application level. Uh, however, I think eventually it would, make, it would make sense, for example, for you to be able to use um, OAuth to, to secure a WebSocket connection. Because, because that handshake is HTTP, you can send back appropriate headers and do, do, do the OAuth process before you actually upgrade to WebSockets. Now, there's a little bit of language in the WebSocket spec, the current revision at the moment, that kind of sort of runs against that, but I, I think that's going to change because you can't really stop people from using HTTP for that first process for WebSockets because that's what it's based on. Um, so yeah, I, I think OAuth or something will work. Uh, one more quick question sure. too. Um, what other uh, server-side frameworks um, in the .NET uh, stack do you, do you know of for uh, doing WebSockets? In the .NET stack? I only know on the on the .NET stack of the WebSockets prototype at the moment that, that I was I was using today in the demo. Um, I am interested in sort of t I want to start talking with some of the people that make alternative alternative web servers on the .NET stack and try to find out whether or not there's anything there. I haven't seen anything yet. Thanks. So we just Good. have our prototype one. Yeah, there's a lot of implementations outside of .NET that that we've seen. You know, including Node.js, for example, is yep. a popular one if you if you're not in the Windows world, but Yes, sir. It's on. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so WebSockets currently it is operated on the TCP, right? So that means uh, so does it support voice? It doesn't. It doesn't support it because it is only using the TCP, right? Does it support voice? Was that the question? Voice communication. Well, currently, and Paul, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but the the current protocol spec uh, allows for binary. But as Paul mentioned before. From a programmability point of view, the API doesn't let yet support any kind of binary traffic. So um, I could definitely see that being an interesting scenario in the future to transmit any, you know, any kind of binary data practically. You are right in that it, I mean, it, it's, it's on TCP. There's no reason why you couldn't be sending voice, binary voice data over TCP. Um, and so it's as, as Craig says, that the real issue would be if you wanted to do it in the browser, the, the API doesn't exist today to do that, because you can't get at that binary data via the API. But I, as things stand, like just today, you could have a, a non-browser WebSocket client using binary, and you could be sending voice, voice data over that. So it's really the browser that's the, and the, the API that's there that's the limiting factor in that regard. So I, I can expect uh, FaceTime kind of applications in future using WebSockets. I can't see why you wouldn't. OK, thank you. Hi there. Uh, is Microsoft planning on uh, leading the way in terms of adoption with something like uh, Exchange, like true push email or that kind of thing? Uh, or are, are you, is it going to be the opposite? Are you going to wait for adoption by everybody else before you actually implement that? You know, I can't, I can't answer the question. Don't, I don't know specific to the product plans. I mean, what I can tell you that is as soon as the, the specs reach a certain level of maturity and stability, we're certainly going to be interested in taking advantage of that capability, you know, as much as possible. So specific product roadmap. I don't know, but absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a cool technology. 
Microsoft is heavily involved in this process in, in both IETF and both and W3C because we see the potential for our product portfolio, not just the browser, but beyond. So there's a lot of interesting opportunity there. I'm sure that we'll be doing a lot in this space. Yeah, it, it makes sense. The exchange suggestion makes a lot of sense. But it, as we pointed out, WebSockets, it's still early days. Sure. Thanks. Right. Can you talk a little bit about on the server side? I mean, typically a TCP IP connection, I think I've got a one-to-one -one and they're, they're stuck together. And, but obviously, it's not the case in, in what we're dealing with here. And also, how do you deal with transient losses of communication to the auto reconnector? Well. <laughs> So, uh, yes, you, you're, always, you're on one-to-one -one connections with WebSockets. Um, so a, a chat demo, for example, would be two one-to-one you know, -one connections that the server's holding on to. Uh, some of the examples, if you actually look at the source code for some of the, the samples that are up there, such as the chat one, uh, at the moment, there's just a little bit of code for you to sort of manually group connections together and then to sort of loop through those connections when you receive one and send to many. Like, I th the thing to keep in mind is that WebSockets is not, it's not like UDP, it's, it's unicast, it's not, it's not broadcast. So if you want to do chat or something like, you know, anything like that, what you're going to do is you're going to manually group those WebSocket connections together. And then when something happens, you're going to loop through them and push a message to, to all of them, asynchronously, of course. But yeah. So that probably answers the first half. Yeah, and I guess some. If I haven't, my if my network connection isn't super stable. Oh um, right. So the second half, the the, the connection stability. Uh, you get the guarantees that TCP gives you. So TCP gives you yeah. reliable delivery and that so sort of thing. It, so this is so really you, a standard connection. A standard so you get socket. yeah because we established a TCP connection and did HTTP over it initially, and then we keep using that TCP connection for the web socket. So yes, you're layered on top of TCP. So you get reliable delivery and all the other guarantees that TCP gives you. And I think from a programmability point of view, you could, you, you subscribe to the, the the close method, so you could say, you know, hey, if this thing closes and I didn't, I wasn't ready for it to be closed, you could, you know, uh, run your connection uh, function again, you, basically reestablish. It's a connection. common thing to use reestablishment te right. techniques. Detect that the connection was dropped because you might have an intermediary in the middle that just decides to kill you randomly. And it, it's a pretty easy thing to sense given the object model that exists in the API. All right, thank you all for coming. I appreciate your time. Enjoy Thanks the rest much. of your day.